you are comfortable. Ah, very comfortable. Thank you. A very good afternoon and heartfelt welcome to the Temple of Harmony's sixth annual interfaith conference. The Temple of Harmony is a non-sectarian center for meditation, spiritual study, and selfless community service. We welcome everyone from all walks of life and from all faiths here to the Temple of Harmony. Along the wall behind me, you will see images of the lineage of spiritual masters or teachers in our tradition, including Paramahamsa Pragnananda Ji on your extreme right, the current spiritual head of our worldwide organization. It is the teachings and guidance of these great spiritual masters that have inspired the Interfaith Conference. This annual conference promotes interreligious awareness, tolerance and respect, and fosters ongoing dialogue, goodwill, and cooperation among the peoples of all cultures and religious traditions. The theme for this year's conference is Attitude of Gratitude. Before we begin this afternoon's auspicious proceedings, I request you to kindly silence your cell phones at this time. In the spirit of the conference theme, we are deeply grateful to our panelists today and to all of you, our audience members, for participating in today's program. Befitting an occasion like the one this afternoon, let us observe a moment of silence for world peace and harmony.
Thank you. We are exceptionally fortunate this afternoon to have amidst us thought leaders and spiritual guides representing multiple faiths and spiritual philosophies. On behalf of the Temple of Harmony, I humbly welcome our esteemed panelists. Starting from my immediate left is Father Ed Shea from St. Peter's Church in Chicago. Dr. Muhammad Kaiseruddin is the chairman of the Council of Islamic Organizations. Swami Atma Budhyananda is a senior monk and director of the Temple of Harmony. Swami Sharanananda Saraswati is a Hindu monk and acharya of the Chinmaya Mission in Chicago. Reverend Tom Capo is a minister of DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church. Venerable Bhante Suyama is a Buddhist monk from Blue Lotus Temple of Woodstock. Our moderator this afternoon is Ms. Asayo Horibe. Ms. Horibe is the president of the Buddhist Council of the Midwest, an organization for all Buddhists in the Chicago and Midwest region. She is also on the board of trustees for the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. We are also very honored today to have a special guest from the Parliament of the World's Religions. Reverend Brian Savage is the Director of Advancement at the Parliament. The Parliament of World's Religions was created 123 years ago to cultivate harmony amongst the world's religious and spiritual communities and foster their engagement with the world and its guiding institutions. The goal being a just, peaceful, and sustainable world. Many of you would know that in 1893, a gathering called World Parliament of Religions was hosted at the World Congress Auxiliary Building, which is now the Art Institute of Chicago. It held its first historic session on the 11th of September in 1893, with an opening session that introduced Swami Vivekananda from India to the world. To begin the conference this afternoon, please, please help me welcome Reverend Brian Savage to the podium. Reverend Savage will speak to us on the critical need for interfaith understanding and dialogue in today's world. It is indeed my deep honor to be here, and I bring you greetings from the Parliament of the World's Religions Executive Director, Dr. Larry Greenfield, uh, who was very disappointed not to be able to be here today, as well as our Board of Trustees. Um, I have a photograph at home. I just ran across it the other day. It was in a photo album of my mother's, and I was probably seven in this particular photograph. I was a cute little kid. I really yeah. was. And in this, in this photo, I'm laughing just full open mouth and I was so happy and I, do, I don't remember the day but I distinctly remember my mother taking that picture with a Polaroid camera that lived in a box that was about this big and the front came out accordion style and it had flash bulbs that lasted one time one picture, and then it was all white and fuzzy. I remember those bulbs. But I look at that picture and I remember being so happy. Life is like that. Life is made up of many moments. Our memories are made of moments. Our lives are changed both positively and negatively in moments. That moment when you look across the room and see for the first time that one who will become your beloved. That moment when you look into the face of a baby and think, that is part of me? That is now my responsibility? That moment when you get that job that changes everything. 
as I was reflecting on the importance of interfaith, it occurred to me that the importance of interfaith as well has everything to do with moments. Moments that indeed change the course of history. In 1893, as, as was mentioned, the interfaith movement, the modern interfaith movement, had its birth right here in Chicago. And 6,000 people, give or take, it's a preacher count, you understand what that's like. 6,000 people made their way here for that original parliament. Just as an aside, when we were discussing Salt Lake City, Utah as the 2015 location for the parliament, many on our board of trustees said, ooh, Salt Lake City, people are going to have to change planes to get to Salt Lake City. There aren't that many direct flights. And I remember saying, in 1893, they came here by steamship, 6,000 of them, because it was that important to come together, to be together, to experience those moments. I think they can change planes in Dallas. <laughs> and they did. 11,000 of them oh. did. That's not a preacher count. Uh -huh. It's over by about 106 people, but it was 11,000, give or take. <laughs> and at that 1893 parliament, a young monk took the stage, as I understand it, not on the original list of speakers, and changed the course of history. And I've often thought, what was in his mind when he stood in front of that crowd and said, sisters and brothers of America. Not insignificant that he said sisters and brothers rather than brothers and sisters. What was in his mind? Did he think, I am going to change the world? Did he think, I am going to give birth to a movement? I think probably not. I think he probably looked out at that crowd and thought, my goodness, there are a lot of people out there. And perhaps he was nervous. Fourteen women as major speakers on that original slate of speakers in 1893, including Susan B. Anthony. Moments that changed the course of history. In 1993, in a moment of great tension in the hall, America's First Nation people spoke peace in a way that changed the conversation. Moments. In 1999, Nelson Mandela spoke publicly of his faith, one of the only, if not the only time, and the importance of people of faith and spirit in ending apartheid moments. <clears throat> in 2004, the Sikh community feeding thousands and the parliament throwing the doors open to the poor who could not afford registrations because it was the right thing to do, moments. 2009, the Australian government using the parliament as a stage on which to become accountable for their own behavior, for their own treatment of their own First Nation people. But the importance of interfaith is present in other moments as well, the seemingly insignificant moments when we reach across the fences in our backyards and meet the neighbor who just moved in, who worships a little differently than we do, who looks a little differently than we do, and a friendship is formed moments. Moments when we refuse to be bystanders to the oppression of others any longer. Moments when we speak peace in the face of violence, and we have many opportunities to do that, sadly. Moments when we speak justice in the face of injustice and in the face of the marginalization of people. Moments when we speak healing to our earth and create policies that change the way we look at the natural world around us. All of these moments are part of who we are as an interfaith community. And together, we really do change the course of history. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was reading over on the way over here, actually, Swami Vivekananda's speech in Chicago in 1893. And, and reading in there, just the gist of it was, coming into this room, we have much to teach. Yes, we all know, or at least think, we have much to teach. But we also have much to learn. 
And those moments, moments like this afternoon, give us another opportunity to do that, bringing all that we are, all of our religious traditions, all of the particularities and peculiarities of who we are to the table, saying this is what I bring to heal the earth and all who call it home. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Savage. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome all of you to this interfaith panel of special friends and new acquaintances. Each panelist will have 10 to 12 minutes to speak regarding their perspective on attitude of gratitude. We have Father Ed Shea. I think we'll just get started, if we may. Father? Okay. As he goes up there, let me tell you, Father Ed Shea joined the Franciscan Order in 1980 and was ordained a priest in 1987. Father Ed Shea has spent most of his priesthood in parish work. Father Ed has served on his provincial council and as director of formation for the Franciscans of Sacred Heart Province. A man who loves to sing, whoa, and tell stories more than anything. He thrives on celebrating the sacraments of the church, a true follower of St. Francis. Father Ed finds reasons to rejoice often in the goodness of God's presence in the world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Gracias a ti, Señor. Would you like to sing with me once? <laughs> sure. Let's try it. Okay. Thank you, Lord, three times, and then gracias a ti, Señor, which means thank you, Lord, in Spanish. Let's try it. Thank you, Lord. 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 Gracias. Gracias a ti, Señor. One more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Gracias a ti, Señor. It was a 14th century Dominican mystic by the name of Meister Eckhart who said, if thank you is the only prayer I say my whole life, that would be enough. If thank you is the only prayer I say my whole life, that would be enough. As we gather here this afternoon, I'm struck by even the title of the conference. It's not just about gratitude, it's about an attitude of gratitude. It has to do with a way of being in the world. It's a, it's a perspective, a, a, a orientation of the spirit. What are we called to be? What does God want from us? In the Christian tradition, we are followers of Jesus Christ, who was born, who lived his whole life, poured out his life for other people, was crucified, died, and was buried. And then he rose from the dead. And the way he lived his life stirred up something in other people, both love and hatred, and all of it 
got caught up in this attitude of gratitude. It's not, gratitude is not a feeling. It's an attitude. It's a way of approaching life. And it really doesn't depend on what happens. I mean, Jesus, for us Christians, was in fact a man rooted in gratitude. His life was a, a statement of gratitude. Even in the worst of times, even when they were crucifying him. Our Pope, Francis, has declared this year what he's called the Jubilee Year of Mercy. Maybe another topic we can use in years to come here. Mm -hmm. And, and what, you know, what strikes uh, me and us, I think, is that there's a difference between human mercy and divine mercy. You know, human mercy is always quid pro quo. I offend you, I ask, I recognize that I offended you, I ask your forgiveness and you forgive me, hopefully. <laughs> But it's always, it takes two sides. Gratitude, we, we think of in a human way in the same way. You have to have a reason to be grateful. The fact is, you don't. The fact is, all you need to do is look around and find it. You know, it, it, like mercy, you know, the, the divine mercy is Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Think about that. Those soldiers never asked for forgiveness. Those disciples who abandoned Jesus never, never asked him to please, please forgive us for what we did wrong. They never asked for that. He just forgave them. It was an attitude of mercy. So how about that? Like if we had an attitude of gratitude. In a letter to the Colossians, uh, St. Paul writes, Because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Clothe yourselves with heartfelt mercy, with meekness, kindness, patience, gentleness. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds the rest together and makes them perfect. And dedicate yourselves to thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, rich as it is, dwell within you. So what I, I think the, the, the Christian perspective on, on gratitude is that it is, it is a, a decision about how we live. It's a way of seeing the world. There's a great prayer by a, a Franciscan like me, a Franciscan. We're, I'm a follower of St. Francis who was born in 1282. He, uh, he came into the world in a time of great turmoil and Francis' message was Pax et bonum in Latin means peace and everything good. He came with this attitude of gratitude. The world is good. You are good. I am good. The, there is goodness. I think having an attitude of gratitude is exactly the opposite of what so many people seem to suggest today, that the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, that everything has fallen apart. Our politics are terrible, our churches are terrible, our families are all falling apart, everything is bad. I don't buy it. I don't think it's true. Richard Rohr, a great Franciscan, has this prayer. Listen to this. Lord, he says, help me to deeply desire the things that I already have. Think about that again. Lord, help me to deeply desire the things that I already have. It's a recipe for gratitude. In other words, you don't have to make it up. You don't even have to look for it. You just have to clear away and pay attention to what you already have and then make a decision, you know, not a feeling, a decision. I wish that I could be in Joliet on July 17, 2016. Ah, here I am. <laughs> I so wish that I had this wife, this husband, this family, this job, this situation in my life and make the decision to deeply desire it. The practice of gratitude is a good spiritual work. You know, and, and for, in the Catholic Christian perspective, it's essential. Our Eucharist, what we celebrate every day, every, and especially on Sunday, means thanksgiving. The Eucharist is our action of thanksgiving. Acción de gracias, we say in Spanish. And, and the question at the end is, what's the other option? I mean, to, to, to have an attitude of gratitude or 
to be full of complaint. You know that you're, that you're not practicing gratitude when your life is all full of complaint. Things are wrong. It's just so wrong. And then you start to play those old tapes, like if only I had a different job, if only I had a different house, if only I had a different wife, if only I had a different situation. You know, and then you start singing the songs, the somebody done somebody wrong song, you know, or the, or the uh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows my sorrow, right? Well, me, I, I'm, I'm celibate. I live my life without a wife. And so the song for the celibates is, especially right around Valentine's Day, I've been cheated, been mistreated, when will I be loved? <laughs> I'm, I'm choosing not to go there. <laughs> I invite you to go there with me to that other place. You know what it is. It, an attitude of gratitude is, it doesn't really matter what happens outside. It's, a, it's really a way of interpreting the world. I'll give you two quick stories and then I'll finish. Good example, so I'm talking about. One comes from a story about Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player who ever lived. Do we all agree on that? Yeah. <laughs> Don't talk to anybody in Cleveland. <laughs> Michael Jordan, a rookie gets to play basketball with Michael Jordan and he, he gets in the game. Well, that night, Michael Jordan is unstoppable. He can't miss. Hits three-point shots and free throws, everything, just unbelievably good. Makes it, does a great, great night. At the end of the night, he gets 60 points. The rookie gets in for a minute, he gets fouled, he makes one out of two free throws, he's done. So after the game, they're talking to Michael, oh, isn't it great, you know, how, how, how great he did. Then they went and talked to the rookie and they said, oh, too bad, huh? I guess you're sad about, I mean, your great opportunity and you're really too bad. And the guy goes, oh, no, <laughs> you got it all wrong, I'm grateful. Tonight, I will always remember, is the night when Michael Jordan and I combined for 61 points. <laughs> An attitude of gratitude, right? Or the child, there's a, a story of a 12-year-old child who lives on a farm, and one day, for her 12th birthday, she gets a brand new pony. Oh my gosh, this is great. I got a brand new pony. This is so exciting and wonderful. And right away she starts to think, well, Jay, but who's going to clean it and who's going to take care of it? And you know what those ponies do, right? Oh man, I don't know. It's, all of a sudden she thinks it's a bad gift. That's, that's not an attitude of gratitude. The attitude of gratitude is the same 12-year-old girl who gets for her birthday uh, a, 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 a room full of manure. And she opens the door and she says, you know, there's got to be a pony around here somewhere. <laughs> so here we are. Let me just throw this one last thing out to you and then I'll be done. If you, you want to be happy for the rest of your life, do these four things. If you're not happy ever, you're probably not doing one of these four things. Here they are. <clears throat> Number one, live in the present. Not in the past, not in the future. In the present. Number two, don't be in a hurry. Number three, don't take yourself too seriously. And number four, be grateful. Thank you, Lord. Sing with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Gracias a ti, Señor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Shea. We have to get him to sing later. <laughs> I know you've been very attentive, and every panelist has something very important to say, but 10, 12 minutes is not a lot of time. So if you have questions, keep them in your mind. Index cards will be passed out. So we'll have a little discussion following each, uh, following the presentations given by all of the panelists. Next, let me introduce Dr. Mohammed Kazoud, who will be our next speaker.
Dr. Kaiser Rudin is one of the founders of the and current chairman of the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago. He's also been the president of Muslim Community and served the Chicago Muslim Community in various capacities for the past 40 years. Professionally, he has a PhD in nuclear engineering and is the manager at the engineering consulting company. He's married with four children. His interests includes, include Islamic education, interfaith, interfaith activities, he's here, yeah. along with and civic engagements. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am really grateful for being invited here this afternoon. This is my first time in this Temple of Harmony and I've learned a very little bit about the temple and I appreciate the services that are provided over here and the openness that is practiced at this temple. I am also thankful to all the management of the uh, Temple of Harmony for arranging this interfaith program. And I am thankful to all of you for being here to listen to the panelists and, and so on. So I had to start with this gratitude. Right? And I am genuinely feel gratitude for all these things that you have given. I feel gratitude for receiving this bouquet of roses. I am thinking back, I was sitting over there, when did I receive a bouquet of flowers, of roses? <laughs> Probably not. You know, I am from India and you know the weddings in India, there are flowers, both the groom wears and the flowers that the bride wears, so I have bought some flowers, right? But I did not receive a bouquet of roses. So thank you very much. I'm thankful to the little man who came and gave me the bouquet of flowers. So there are so many things that to be thankful for over here, right? So what is the opposite of gratitude? You could say being ungrateful, but I really think that it is sort of a resentment. And if I was a jerk, and allow me to be a jerk for just a few minutes, couple minutes to demonstrate. If I was a jerk, I would say that, look, I live in Wilmette. I drove 50 miles to come here and then I'll be driving 50 miles back to my home and I'm given 10 minutes to speak? <laughs> I am the chairman of the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago that represents 400,000 Muslims and I get 150 or 200 people to listen to me? Why aren't there 1,000 people over here? Those are a couple of things I could be uh, if I was a jerk, I would say that those two things and I will have a resentment. How would you feel about me? <laughs> like as if you a jerk, right? <laughs> right. So this, this was really to demonstrate what a gratitude can do versus what a resentment can do. There is absolutely no reason to be resentful. Have, you know, you, you could have gotten many scholars of Islam here in the Chicago area and instead you chose me and I'm really truly thankful for being here. And I don't want to exceed my time <clears throat> so I want to give you a few perspectives of being uh, of the attitude of gratitude from the sayings of our Prophet Muhammad and from the Quran that our holy book. Uh, Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said that you if you do not thank your fellow human beings, you cannot thank God. Mal la yashkurin nasa la yashkurilla. Who, one who does not thank his fellow human beings cannot thank God. And so this is so, so pertinent that, uh, you know, when I came to America, that was almost 50 years ago, and um, I had people Everybody saying thank you. 
you hold the door open say thank you you do many many little things and say thank you and i was so shocked why are these people thanking for little things i guess in india we don't thank each other as much as the as the people in america do and probably people in britain who are a little bit uh, tight they probably do not thank as much right so the attitude of gratitude exists here in america at every level and which is very good and lately we might be losing that that's why we see all these shootings and killings and so on so it's very important to get this attitude of gratitude back that the people should be grateful to the police officers for providing the security that they do and the police officers should be grateful to the community for providing the support and and love but to the so if this attitude instead of hatred that's going on right now if that was changed to gratitude then things would be resolved quite a bit so thank you for arranging this thing i hope some of the uh, i wish some of the law enforcement of community is here i don't know if any law enforcement people are here but they would also get the same message now when you are being grateful gratitude there are two parties involved right one who has done some favor to you and then you return the favor or be thankful express your gratitude for receiving the favor from so two parties are involved uh so what does a person who expresses thanks or gratitude receive one is of course he has received some something and that can be i'll come to that what is the what, what do we need to be grateful for grateful for uh so the person who expresses gratitude expresses thanks uh, quran tells us that god who i'll come to the point about why we need to be thankful to god but he says that la in shakartum la azidannakum if you are grateful i'll increase your blessings that's all and uh, i remember when when the father was saying that all you need to do to say thank you thank you thank you lord that's enough and that's what quran said tells us that you thank for what he has given you and he'll keep on increasing you don't have to keep seeking more and more and more just say thank you god for giving me this thank you god for giving me this and he will keep on increasing the blessings for you and as far as the people who are charitable who are in a position to do some favors to you what should be their attitude that's also very important gratitude as i said involves two people one who has given something and the one who has received something so the person who has given something there are two points to remember if you are fortunate enough to be in the position of giving and i'm sure every one of you is in a position of giving charity is something in in our faith one of the teachings of prophet muhammad peace be upon him is that charity is as little as you smile when you meet somebody that's enough you don't you don't have to give money you don't have to give anything just smile show your happy attitude when you when you're meeting somebody and that is a charity in itself but if somebody has a lots of money a lots of things that that god has blessed him with and sees people who are desperately in need of things and and so on and all he can find is something really rotten from his home that he has no use for it probably throws in the garbage then he says okay instead of throwing in the garbage i'll give it to this person and maybe he can use it what will the person who is receiving that kind of a gift will feel looking at the stature of the person who is giving and the thing that he is giving will it develop some sort of a resentment in him in him or not that's why one of the rules that god has set in the in the quran lan tanalu albirra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun you will never you will never achieve piety 
unless you give from something that you love. Think what you love. Money, clothes, time, talent, whatever you have. If you give something that you love, then you can achieve piety. Only if you, if you do that, then you achieve piety, otherwise you won't. Now, think of the recipient of your charity. He sees that, okay, you love this much, something so much that you are willing to share something. Will that gratitude evolve out of that person or not? Compared to that, you give something which was completely wasteful, was to be thrown away anyway. So, you will never achieve piety until you spend from what you love. And also, another etiquette for those who give is that you should not expect anything in return. Not even gratitude. Of course, people come and give gratitude, that is fine, you accept it, graceful, uh, gracefully accept it, but don't expect it. And the Quran again says, إِنَّمْ إِنَّا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا That indeed we feed the people who are hungry, but we expect for the sake of God alone, but we don't expect anything, not even gratitude from them. Because if you are expecting something in return and you don't receive it, you will feel some sort of a resentment in you. So those are the etiquettes of those who are giving and those who are receiving. May God guide us to be grateful for everything that, that he has given. And of course, I didn't come to you. Am I about time? Mm -hmm. Just one, take me 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. We need, I, I only talked about being grateful to human beings, right? But if you are receiving some little things from human beings, what about all the things that you receive from God? Everything from head to toe. Your eyes that you are able to see, your mind that you are able to think, your hands that you are able to use, your feet that you are able to walk with, and the beautiful planet Earth that He has given us. Not there is nothing out in the in the universe that anybody has been able to find so far that can accommodate human beings. And He has developed, He has given us this planet, and all those things that He has given. How much? should we be thankful to God. And we do, then, in, then inshallah he'll keep, it, keep on increase, increasing the blessings for us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Next. Oh, don't lose those flowers. <laughs> As we continue on, let me introduce Swami Sharananda. We've been friends a long time. Yes. My goodness. Okay. Okay. Swami Sharananda is the resident Acharya, or teacher, of the Chinmaya Mission in Chicago since 1993. In his young age, Swami Ji was inspired by the life and teachings of the revered Swami Chinmayananda Daji. Did I get it? Wow. Yes. A dynamic spiritual master of Vedanta and joined the mission to serve humanity through humility and selfless service. Swami Ji's joyful, loving, and humble personality is a great source of inspiration to all that come in contact with him. I guarantee it. Please give him a hand. Samastajana Kalyani Niratam Karunamayam Namami Chinmayam Devam Sadgurum Brahmavitvaram Namaspanantaya Sahasra Murtaye Sahasra Padaksi Siruru Vahave Sahasra Nami Pursaya Saswate Sahasra Koti Gadhari Namaha Sahasra Koti Gadharini Namaha. My salutations to all the panelists 
and all the gurus and to all of you i am really i feel very happy to be here because this is the home of my guru bhai because swami pragyanan ji and we are very close and i'm so happy that i feel that i am at home three fifty three so three sixty three that is four or three i'm to end today's topic is attitude of gratitude of course different speakers told regarding thankful to be thankful to somebody but gratitude is much more than just to be thankful when somebody gives us suppose somebody gives us a diamond necklace who would give me suppose somebody gives then what will tell to that individual thank you so much isn't it then after some time when we we are going on the road somebody will come and will have a knife in the hand and will tell give me that necklace otherwise i will make you neck less <laughs> then at that time what will do will be thankful to the person who has given us the necklace or will curse that person <laughs> see that thankfulness it will change that this person really created a problem for me isn't it all the problems in life is faced by people those who have money they face more face more problem than those who are poor poor face problems there is no doubt but rich people face more problems particularly from income tax they face problems isn't it so thankful it changes very fast to hate to anger but gratitude is a value to be thankful to somebody is a virtue but to be grateful is a value there is a difference between value and virtue virtues can change virtues can, one cannot one cannot be virtuous in one place one minute to virtuous in another situation but gratitude is such a quality it is such a value if one has developed that quality then it will stay with that individual irrespective of whatever happens if somebody praises we will be grateful if somebody is hitting also we can be grateful to that individual i will tell you a story there is a great saint in india there was of course now there are great saints are there i'm talking of to who by golden days his name was sant eknath from the state of maharashtra in india he was famous for not getting angry at all he will never get angry sant eknath then people are very jealous of him because there are so many great saints they get angry okay because of certain reason whatever if the disciples are not listening behaving properly they get angry but sant eknath will never get angry so all the great saints and all the learned people they are very jealous of him they tried so many ways how to make him angry and one person really he took upon him i will surely make this person to get angry i will he is not really that good people are honestly praising him then he hired somebody he cannot do that because he is a very important person in the community so he hired somebody and told you know i'll give you 1000 rupees can you make this person angry now yes but 500 rupees rupees in india it is give me in advance so he gave because he has money he gave 500 rupees then some taknath every day he will go to a river to take bath okay and after the tradition is after taking bath we have to worship lord sun with gayatri mantra there is a mantra we have to worship him and some taknath will when he took bath and he was coming back this person was hiding behind a tree and he has pan i i don't know what is the other word for pan that means people chew that pan and there will be it's all red water will come inside pan then he chewed and he kept lot of spit in his mouth and when sant eknath after being fresh when he was coming he spat on him sant eknath didn't tell a single word again he went to take bath in this way i don't want to continue so long 108 times he spat on that on sant eknath okay but now after 108 time when sant eknath was coming 
at that time he was trying to spit but there was no spit in his mouth because he has to drink water to spit now spit is not coming only air is coming so he is spitting he is trying very hard but nothing is coming out now he is completely thirsty exhausted maybe dehydrated now because there is no so anyhow at that time he felt that he cannot make him angry he fell at his feet and told you know i am so sorry please bless me i am your disciple sant eknath completely fell at his feet and told you know i am so grateful to you now how you can be grateful to me i did harm to you now today i have heard from my childhood days that if one takes bath in this holy river 108 times continuously then one will get liberation but there is no occasion there is no chance to take hundred who will take bath 108 times unless one has gone little mental and today you gave me that opportunity so i am grateful so this is called gratitude gratitude is not only when somebody gives something gratitude only when one doesn't give and one gives plenty in slap if we can be that also, that time if we are can tell thank you then know that that person has gratitude gratitude is a value it it is developed within the individual when you understand that whatever in the life we have got or whatever we have not got everything is by god's grace this thinking this understanding makes us grateful one and if one has understood that everything whatever is in our life everything god has given i may tell that this is my hair. i have no hair but i am telling to those who have hair look at this is my hair this is my hand these are my eyes this is my leg but actually we have not made the hair we have not made the hand we have not made the heart how can you tell it is mine this is big lie the big lie when you tell it is my son my child oh swami this is my child what you have done for the child have you created the heart of the child have you created the nose of the child we have not created anything but we try to claim ownership that it is my child and then go through all the problems but scriptures tell no children have come through us no doubt but they are not ours we are not the owner of the children we are the caretaker of the children we should caretaker because god has given them to us if this gratitude is there if this understanding is there automatically at gratitude will be developed it is a quality of the mind it is not a physical action when somebody is giving us a flower we may give something to that individual some other items are only give that is that is a physical act it is not necessarily a value a value is that which will make a person always peaceful that is a value a value is a value when it is practiced always it will make our mind peaceful to be truthful suppose i have taken a candy from the refrigerator and my mom will ask who has taken the candy only i am the only child at home i cannot tell and the camera is already put focus towards the refrigerator and mom is asking mom and dad they are standing who took the candy i told nobody should touch the candy i don't know why she kept the candy in the refrigerator in the first place but now and she has written on the top don't eat the candy but i have written already okay now i am questioning at the time what i will tell sorry i have taken the candy i am truthful there but when it comes to then i become a big officer now i am earning lot of money and income tax to now i am filing the at that time she will tell a lie nobody tells the right thing okay everybody is a liar in that sense means not everybody everybody nobody puts the right figure okay that means it is not a value at all it is just a virtue at one time you are truthful because of certain reason but you not a value so that if truthfulness is not a value it will not help at all but gratitude is a value it comes through understanding it is not come it doesn't come through by giving something no it comes through understanding that everything in life whether it is hand whether it is um, um, uh, the finger whether it is head whether it is brain whatever everything is by god's grace whatever is around for the air fire water the land everything has come by god's grace then automatically that attitude will develop that is an attitude that is an action attitude is a function of the intellect action is a function of the hands and legs it physically it is done 
So this understanding is very much important, which will come only when we sit a little quietly and think of her. Think of her. Is this job? Now we are always ungrateful to the person who gives us the job. Suppose somebody has given us a job, we get angry on that individual after some time, if they, I don't get a raise. But if we are grateful, if our gratitude is there, always we will be grateful to that individual who has given the job. And if it is, we develop that quality, first thing we will be happy. Second thing, whatever is needed in our life will automatically come. We need not have to struggle. Now everybody is struggling to earn, struggling to earn, to get in life. But that becomes very difficult. But it should not be. Life is very simple. Develop that attitude of attitude. Everything, whatever is needed, only say things will not come. Whatever is needed, surely it will come to us. May God's blessings be with us. And we understand and develop that gratitude for him. Hari Om. Thank you, Swamiji. Are you all comfortable? <laughs> oh, you're too comfortable. Everybody stand up. <clears throat> Take a deep breath. <laughs> greet the person to your right. Wait, to my right. Okay. And greet the person to your left. It's going to be dark. It's hard for me to do either. <laughs> I'm turning one way. <laughs> Okay, your minds are opened up again. On to our next speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Our next panelist is Reverend Tom Kampel. Reverend Kampel is a commissioner on the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission and served on many nonprofit boards and committees including the Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, and the partnership of a drug-free a drug -free Cedar Rapids. Reverend Tom Capo was also a moderator for the Ethical Perspectives on the News, a show sponsored by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, and televised on the local ABC affiliate KCRG. Reverend Capo currently serves as the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Naperville. Thank you. Let's welcome him. First, a little bit about Unitarian Universalism. We believe that each person is on their in own individual spiritual journey. So very much like the Temple of Harmony here, we see wisdom in all faith traditions. We also see wisdom in personal, personal, a person's personal experience and in present day prophets, women and men who, who have wise things to pass along, such as our panelists here. But as, as Unitarian Universalists, because we are all kind of on our own journey, um, if you were to ask a Unitarian Universalist what their thoughts would be about gratitude or about God or about anything, they would all be a little different. So you could say, um, you know, what's your belief about God? And you might have two or three people in the Unitarian Church give you five or six opinions. Um, because we, we believe so many different things. But, but we, we look within to find what is true for us and we let that guide us on our journey. So I was thinking about gratitude, and I, I wouldn't be able to say that we have any particular way of looking at gratitude. But what does affect me and in, in, in how I see gratitude is that I see it as both a discipline and an awareness of awe and wonder in our life. A discipline because I don't think it's something that is natural. It's something we have to cultivate. We have to practice. A spiritual practice is not something you, you just do because it seems natural to do. It's something you do because it's something you are intentional about. I offered the eulogy when my father died about five years ago. And I spoke about his hobbies, his likes, his dislikes, and his many trials. You see, he was an alcoholic. I could have easily spent time dwelling on the pain that that caused me. 
his rage, his working long hours, his wrecking cars and almost killing other people. But instead I spoke about the positive things that he did for me. Waking up on Christmas morning early and putting together toys for all of us children. Attending my many sports events, though I was, I was pretty horrible at every sport. Um, teaching me how to, to repair my car. You know, he was, he was so wonderful with that. I mean, and patient. We had a, I had a 1965 Fastback 2 Plus 2 Mustang. Fabulous car. But we had to change the starter in that 10 times in two years. And he taught me about the importance of, of family, especially extended family, spending time with our relatives in New Orleans and, and other parts of the country. I spoke about these, but what I spent the bulk of my time on was his transformation. He became a recovering alcoholic late in his 40s. He showed me that through his life there is always potential to change, to grow, to be better, healthier, more considerate. He showed me that anyone can change from being selfish to being concerned about others. One person even got up during the memorial service and told how my father had saved his life, kept him from drinking on that day when he wasn't wanting to live. To speak about those gratitudes blesses us all. Think about how it touches you to, to, to hear someone else be grateful for the wonders that they experience in their life or the, the touching moments that they've had. Sometimes when someone does something nice for you, you can say, Thank you. But it's more than that. Spiritual practice. Every time she sees someone, she walks up to them and says something from her heart. That's a beautiful necklace you have. Or, you have a beautiful dog. Or, Thank you for opening the door for me. It's a practice. She's doing unto others as she would have them do unto her. But, but doing that practice means that she has to see the world differently. She has to look at the world as if in every moment you have the opportunity to experience awe and wonder. And from that awe and wonder, you are grateful and you offer something out. But you also take something in. My father's transformation transformed me. And I told him that it did. And that stayed with me more deeply because I not only recognized it, but I said it to him. And I said it to all the people who came to his eulogy that day, to his memorial service. Every time we express gratitude, kindness, humility, we are all increased because at our essence we are all one body one people. So, it's not only about saying thank you. It's about recognizing the awe and wonder. For me, I, I was a pretty pessimistic person for much of my life. And for me to get to a place where I could begin to see the world with awe and wonder, I had to undertake a spiritual practice. I mindfully and intentionally looked out into the world and into myself. And I started a prayerful practice based on gratitude. 
looking at the many blessings in my life, the things that happen to me and around me that not only enhance my life, but bring beauty and wonder and awe into my life. This prayer for me was, I started with speaking the yearnings of pain and joy from my heart. I spoke about, I said the many names of the divine spark that lives through all of us. And then I began expressing gratitude, the many blessings, the flower, the sunset, the birth of my sons, the love of my wife, the recovery of my father. And some of those things I expressed over and over and over again. And then at the end of my prayer, I let my grateful spirit go out into the world to connect to those in need of love, healing, energy. I did not expect anything from this practice. I just did it over and over and over again. And what happened for me is I went from that glass half full person to a person who could see the world differently, could see the smallest blessing, to see how much love there was in my life, so much gratitude that I was over full and able to offer gratitude out into the world. I believe gratitude has so much to offer us. It helps us see the world differently with awe, wonder, beauty. It binds us more closely together and it can transform us in unexpected ways if we attack, begin a discipline of gratitude. I'd like to offer a meditation to close this time together. So if you turn in for a spirit of prayer or meditation, I invite you to do so. Grant us grace to be grateful for the things that sometimes we take for granted, the most common things in life, the courtesies, the kindness shown to us. Let us see them with the wonder and awe and miracle that they are. And when we complain that we are carrying heavy burdens, may we instead see that others share them, often carrying the greater part of the load. Help us to be thankful for the patience of friends who take time to understand us. Or isn't that miraculous and wonderful? And for those who love us even when we give them very little in return. Help us to see how much has come to us that we've never deserved. By remembering these things, they will melt away the coldness within our hearts. They will draw us more closely together and give us the opportunity to be more than we are. With a grateful heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Kappa. If you still have questions, please think about them and write them down. Our next panelist is Bhante Suyama from Woodstock. The Lotus Sangha.
Venerable Bhante Suyama is an ordained Buddhist monk of the Theravada tradition from the Blue Lotus Temple located in Woodstock. Suyama translates as good time. Really? <laughs> like many others, Venerable Suyama was always in search of his own happiness and meaning in life. Ultimately, he discovered happiness in this life would only come from helping others to find out for themselves how to become free from their own suffering. <laughs> Thank you. Namo tase bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tase bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tase bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Bhutam saranam gachami Dhammam saranam gachami Sanghaṁ saranam gachami Welcome, noble friends, <laughs> fellow clergy, and thank you so much, host, for bringing us here together in a collective thought today. What I chanted as best that I could. <laughs> uh, my fellow friend, Indian friends here would probably think, yeah, I remember a few of those in Sanskrit. But uh, what that sums up is that I pay homage to the perfected Buddha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in his teachings, the Buddha Dhamma. And I also take refuge in the Sangha, which is the community of monks and the lay practitioners that come to our temple. Collectively, we express gratitude every time we come to the temple and chant. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, a little glimpse of what it's like in our temple up in Woodstock. Woodstock, Illinois, of course. I didn't come from Woodstock, New York, as somebody said. Mm -hmm. Only two hours, not two days. So my story today, I talked to the chief monk, uh, Venerable Sujatha. He is now the chief monk of North America, Canada, and Mexico. And we were talking about this topic several months ago. And um, I says, well, I said, Venerable Sujatha, we're talking about gratitude. He says, oh, because I'm a student. He said, oh, that should be, you know that one. And I said, I do. He says, yeah, yeah. When Siddhartha became enlightened, the first action he ever did was out of gratitude. And that's the story that I wanted to give you today. In a nutshell, in his history, 2,600 years ago, Prince Siddhartha, 29 years old, having everything in the world, this had everything, and he still was not happy. Everything in the world he could ever have, destined to be king to his loyal subjects. Still not happy. He wandered, I think some people call aimlessly, with some ascetic monks for six years, spending a lot of time in deep meditation, trying to figure out the pain and suffering with inside of him, fasting, becoming skin and bones. And then a little girl came up to him, Sujata is her name, and fed him rice. And at that moment he says, I can't live the luxurious life, and I can't live the opposite either, because I'll die starving. In the middle path, in the midstream, is where we should be within our means. And I think among many of us, we go beyond our means sometimes, and we need to be pulled back to that ground zero and stay within our means so we don't get in trouble. He left the pack of six. Bodhagaya, India, 100 kilometers south of the Nepal, India border. He settled underneath a fig tree 
we know today is the tree of enlightenment, the Bodhi tree. And it's hot there. <laughs> I was in Lumbini, and that's a few hundred, uh, that's a hundred miles north, I believe. And at nine o'clock in the morning, 104 degrees. So Westerners, tourists, they tour early in the morning before it gets too hot. So I, I, I'd imagine the weather is going to be the same. Just to give you an idea, it was. So Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha, finds this tree and he says, he claims, sits down, Indian style, says, I am not going to move from this position until I figure out the true emancipation from my suffering. He had an enormous amount of practice spending time with those six ascetics for six years. He says, the skin can fall off my bones. My bones can wither up and dry away and blow with the wind, but I'm not leaving until I get my answer. And so he sat. So the 49th day comes along, and it's May, and it's full moon day. He gets it. He finally understands. He had bits and pieces of it, and through deep meditation practice, he had the ability to concentrate his mind and determine the real nature of himself. He was enlightened. He was well. He was happy. He was peaceful. Not for just a moment, but forever, for eternal. Sitting there, smiling, if you ever see a Buddhist statue, they have a half smile on, and you know, he's smiling, just happy and content. First action he does, he gets up from underneath the tree, turns around 180 degrees, sits back down, and gazes in admirement of this beautiful fig tree that protected him. They gave him protection and shelter so he could figure out what was going on in his mind. The heat of the summer, yes, monsoons, pretty bad. <laughs> when I was talking about this not too long ago in my temple, I said this guy was the original tree hugger. You know, he just loved nature. He finally connected. He finally saw something inside that tree was just like what's inside himself. Or in Deer Park when you see deers out there. You know, we're not too dissimilar from these animals roaming this world. Treat them with compassion, love, and kindness as much as you can. So his ascetic friends came up to him. Oh, did you hear Siddhartha got enlightened? Oh, okay. Well, they questioned him, he says, because well, they believed in many gods. How many gods did it take you to reach enlightenment? He said, Buddha said none. Oh, what are you grateful for? I'm grateful for the fig tree. As simple as that. Something that helped him get to enlightenment. He figured it out for himself. He knew he had to without the help of anything but a tree. So think about that. When we're struggling in our lives, sometimes the answers are very plain right in front of us. We don't have to look too far. We're grateful for those answers that come and go and the challenges that meet us each and every day. He was well, happy, and peaceful. And that's his teachings. If you've ever done mindfulness meditation practice, what we call metta, loving kindness and compassion, that's a mantra we repeat after ourselves over and over again. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. Care to join along? Please sit upright. Hold your palms together lightly. Drift your eyes to the floor if you like to. And repeat after me. May I be well. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be peaceful. See those words. Now I'll repeat them. You don't have to repeat them. Just look at them as I say them. May I be well. May I be well. 
May I be happy. May I be peaceful. You see these words getting closer to you within your mind. Vividly well becomes larger. We form a connection with that word. If we say this over and over and over again, we can't help but feel well. I say we place a gratitudinal check to this word well in appreciation. Look back today on a time when you felt well. Feel grateful for feeling well. May I be happy. Look at that word. Every time you say, may I be happy, it gets closer to you in your mind. You feel it. You smile. You remember a time today when you felt happy or at least content. Yes, some days I have the clown laugh look in my face that I'm really happy, but that's usually short-lived. You're feeling grateful for one time today that you felt happy. May I be peaceful. Look at that word peaceful. Look at each letter of that word and paint it inside your mind real closely. You maybe even begin to smile a little bit because a little bit of gratitude and I'll check to this word and we can reflect back today, someday, sometime today, when we felt peaceful. Okay, let's do this one more time. Please repeat after me. May I be well. May I be well. May I be, well. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be peaceful. Now, before you open your eyes, remember what a Buddha statue looks like, sitting upright and having a half smile. Place a half smile on your lips and slowly open your eyes. Thank you so much. May peace be with you. Thank you, Bhante. Well, we spent 37 minutes listening to different perspectives on attitude and gratitude. Now the best part comes because we have questions. Oh, we? Okay. Some are directed specifically to one panelist, but when you respond, try to be as concise as possible. One that struck me, this is for Dr. Kaiserudin. Are there teachings in the Quran to help people overcome racism? Yes. Um, there is a verse in the Quran that says God created human beings from one male and one female. Then he decided to make them into nations and tribes so that they get to know each other. The objective is to get to know each other, not to fight each other, not to hate each other. And Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said that God does not look upon the appearance of anybody. And appearance includes everything. Color of the skin, stature, tall, short, bulky, everything, what we are wearing. God does not look at that. He looks at what's in your heart. That is the teaching Islam offers. Anybody else have a thought on that? Up here. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible that uh, Christians use is uh, certainly speaks to that same truth in the, in the Jewish tradition that all men and women are created in the in the image and likeness of God. So they there is no room for racism. 
Yes. I would say uh, in, in, in Unitarian Universalism, our first principle is the to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, and for us, um, it's important for us to not only live that by how we treat each other, but to um, try to work with those people who are on the fringes, the ones who are who are the ones who experience prejudice. Um, to help them have a voice and to feel of worth in, and that they have dignity. Swami? Yes. In Bhagavad Gita, it is told, Yomam pasyati sarbatra sarbam chamai pasyati tasya hamya pranasyami sasamena pranasyati What does it mean? Yomam pasyati sarbatra who sees me in each and every being, not only living beings, even inner things. Yomam Pasyati Sarbata Sarbam Chamai Pasyati Who sees me in everybody and everybody in me, I am never lost for that individual. I am always with that individual. So that is no question of racism. Then it is told, Jati niti kula gotra duragam nama rupa guna dosa varjitam. Jati, jati means caste, jati, niti, a type of rules, codes and conduct one is following, jati niti. Kula, kula means the clan one is born. So those things really divide us. But it is told, if a person wants to be happy and wants to be closer to God, then those things should not be given importance at all. So it is very clearly told. Okay. Um, just to continue the meditation practice, we get into a point that may all living beings be well, be happy, be peaceful, be free from suffering, free from pain, free from worry. And whether it's freshly cut flowers or a Bodhi tree that just protected you from getting enlightenment, we treat everything as one. What would you say is the biggest problem that we face in our interfaith community relations? What I, uh, I would come some, to my mind immediately, kind of along with the notion of racism, is the very common um, practice in the world of us and them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be as simple as uh, Cubs and White Sox. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you later which one I am. <laughs> but it, it, you know, there are certain appropriate us and thems like that. But when we develop this attitude of separation, us and them, male and female, rich and young, poor and I mean, uh, old, and, uh, old and young, poor and rich, uh, religion differences, you know, and we become comfortable in our us. And I think this becomes the, the, the root of the problem. I think the Franciscan approach has always been to try to expand that notion of us, even to the point of what if we looked at the world and not as us and them, but us and us. <laughs> if we could have an attitude that everyone belongs, of course we would have sibling rivalries, but we probably wouldn't have any war. It's us and us. I'd like, I'd like to build on that a little bit. Um, most recently, a couple of years ago, well, six, eight years ago now, uh, I was serving a church in Cedar Rapids, and I don't know if you remember, there were floods, massive floods in Cedar Rapids. Um, all of the faith communities uh, came together to help all the people who were um, just devastated by this event. You know, their, their, their houses, uh, they didn't have a place to live, but particularly those who were homeless were, were struggling. And, and we came together and we went out into the community and we found those people who were on the streets or didn't know what to do, who, were, uh, who needed um, some counseling, or pastoral care. Um, and we worked together as one for a long time. Um, but then 
we were at the beginning of a meeting and one of our members wanted to say a little prayer just a blessing for those who have been doing all this hard work and there were those there that felt like if if it wasn't the prayer wasn't the way that they prayed it wasn't okay and they walked out and, and I think that happens uh, when we try to work together that instead of focusing on the things we can accomplish and the wonders that we can do we focus on the things that separate us that are different and we sep when we we focus on those separations those us and thems like you were talking about um, the community begins to fall apart and um, I, I just you know I've, I've worked in interfaith uh, uh, interfaith in, in many different cities and, and I think if we can find the things that we have in common the issues that we want to change in the world and can work together on those that's what's most important helping the people in the streets that was important helping with racism that's important if we focus on the differences we won't get much accomplished thank you I, uh, if I may share, when we had the first parliament after 100 years here in Chicago, um, we were trying to bring all the religions together, and history says that we're not supposed to like them, and, well, we don't like what they do. And at that first parliament, there were a couple of communities that up and left because we, we tried to be very inclusive. And once we learn, this is from my perspective, that we need one another to survive. We need one another to survive. And if we don't have that respect for one another and honor the path that they've chosen, then we're going to be lost. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> According to your teachings and beliefs of your religion or philosophy, what are your views, spiritual or philosophical, on mental illness? Mental illness is a big category. Well, I could start by saying that mental illness is like any other illness. The difference is that other illnesses show up um, in pain or other symptoms which the person realizes that there is something wrong that's why his stomach is hurting or his head is hurting or or something else the mental illness is something that other people may realize that there is something wrong but the person with mental illness will not the person with mental illness will be in uh, denial so the the uh, it becomes the responsibility of others who are close to um, the person with mental illness to take that into account and be extra caring, extra supportive in order for them to be able to receive some treatment that they desperately need. Father? I'll always jump in. I don't. <laughs> um, we are we are all part of, or many of us are part of faith communities or different communities. Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to be aware of is that that there are people within our faith communities who have mental illness, and how we treat them is a reflection of our own beliefs our own uh, ability to live our faith in the world. Um, 
you know, we're not perfect with that, but I think that our churches are our training grounds for how we can be our best selves and how we can work with each other, especially those of us who are, are fragile or damaged in some way. Thank you. Father? On a very personal level, I am a recovering alcoholic. So what I've learned in 30 years of sobriety is that the first word of the 12 steps is we. Recovery begins with a notion of we. And so uh, there's a lot of various thoughts in my head about recovery, but it has to do with the notion that you know it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a community, like Reverend just said, to bring healing energy. But the, certainly in the, in the Catholic Christian tradition, the, the, the uh, healing energy of Jesus is the most consistent energy. You know, he, his presence in the world was a healing presence. He came and healed. He healed people possessed by demons and others that were, you know, well, they were mentally ill. And so that, that is one of the most consistent messages of the New Testament um, is this healing energy and in the Old Testament also in our biblical tradition. And so um, I think it has to do though with recognizing that we're all a little bit in need of healing. You know, there's a great quote that says, we have to come to realize that all of us, including ourselves, are, uh, you know, to a certain extent emotionally ill as well as frequently wrong. <laughs> so let's just start there. We're all a little bit off the mark, and we're often wrong. Now we're, now we're able to talk to each other. Thank you. Then we're able to, to you know, have a conversation with each other. Well, what are those three things? We are, uh, we are often wrong. To a certain extent, we are all emo emotionally ill and frequently wrong. Two things. Okay. Emotionally ill and frequently wrong. Can I interject that I have a very dear friend that said that every person needs 12 hugs a day to survive. <laughs> so if you start on that... <laughs> Because touching is healing. And I'm a medical person, and this is what I found out. Touching is healing. Moving right along. <laughs> How, what is the attitude of a suffering person How does he have, what does he have to do to cultivate to be in peace? Probably needs a hug. <laughs> Twelve. Jump in there. Can you read that again, please? Suffering person. You know, I, again, I, I think that... Um, A suffering person needs us, needs us, all of us, to be in their lives, to show them love, like you say, give them hugs. Um, suffering is, is most difficult when it's done alone. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we can, uh, I, you know, when, I'm, when I've been in a difficult situation, um, certainly I've tried many things to deal with my own personal suffering, meditation, prayer, exercise. But the thing that's most effective is being in relationship with someone who loves me. Father? One of the uh, really most powerful stories of Jesus in the Bible is the story of what we call the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a story about, uh, it's, it's complicated, but there, basically it's a story about a wounded man. And, um, and 
a priest passes by and walks on the other side, a, a Levite passes by and goes to the opposite side, and a Samaritan, who are the hated people of the town, uh, attends to the person's need. Dr. Martin Luther King, in a wonderful commentary on it, said this. He said, the, the priest walked by and saw the wounded man, and he said to himself, if I help that man, what will happen to me? <laughs> I'll be, I won't be able to go to temple, I won't be able to serve, I, I can't do it, I'm sorry, I feel sorry, but I can't do it. The Levite walked by and he said, if, if I help that man, what will happen to me? I'm, I'll be late, I, I have an appointment, I, I don't have time, I'm too important. The Samaritan walked by, same place, same situation, and he saw the man and he thought to himself, if I don't help that man, what will happen to him? <laughs> it's a completely different question. Because we knew, we heard in the story, that the man was half dead. So if I don't help that man, that man will die. And it's just a powerful reinterpretation of things. It's not enough to feel sorry for somebody. I think that the work of healing has to do with getting your hands dirty. But it messes up your life. That's a, the Good Samaritan had somewhere else to go and he t spent two extra days taking care of this guy and then paid for it out of, out of his own pocket. Yeah. Time for one more? We'll have one more. And then you can all stand up and take a comfort break. How should we help changing help how should we help changing the educational system to teach the values of gratitude which otherwise completely absent in our fully commercialized and capitalized world? Wow. I'll take that one. <laughs> this is usually a simple answer to complexity, so. Um, <laughs> When we had Sandy Hook, we were in the temple that night. We have many different faiths come to the temple. And they said, uh, one lady says, so what is your religion? Tell us about this shooting. What, what, what do we have to do? And when I heard the question about what we have to do teaching, um, our venerable nun, Bikwani, she, she stood silently and she said, the Dalai Lama just answered that not too long ago by saying there's not enough loving kindness and compassion in this world. And he left it at that. What that means is we have to start very, very young. And that's what they do in these Indian Sri Lankan countries. The Venerable Sujatha in Sri Lanka right now just did a baby blessing, 300 pregnant ladies in their womb, uh, yet to be born. A blessing, a loving kindness and compassion. So it begins well before they go into preschool. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their thoughts and their wisdom from their perspective and from their religious traditions. Thank you for these. I have many more questions, however, uh, we, we have a restriction on time. So thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Swami Amatavyananda Giri to speak and give us our closing. Please give me your kind attention. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A professor entered the classroom, as we all have experienced in our schools and colleges. So the professor, one fine morning, entered the classroom 
and he asked the students, please be, be prepared for a surprise test. All the students were looking at him. What's going to happen next? Professor handed down question paper to each one of them. And as usual, he handed this question paper facing down, so nobody could see. Once he finished distributing this question papers to all the students, then he asked them to turn the page and start answering. To the surprise of students, there were no questions. <laughs> but there was a dot, black dot, in the center of the page. They looked at each other, what is this? Could not understand. Professor told, my students, I want you to explain or write what you see there. Well, the, whatever this job is, it has to be accomplished. So everybody started writing something. After some time when everyone finished writing, professor collected the answer sheets and then one after the other he started reading them aloud in front of everybody without any discrimination or exception. Once he finished all the answer sheets readings, then he said, you all have described very beautifully about the black dot and nobody wrote about the white paper. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what happens in our life. We always look at or we focus at the black dots. We don't look at what the white page life has given us. We don't look at the beauty of nature. We look at the chirping of birds. We don't feel aroma of flowers. We are so busy in just looking at black dots everywhere. We focus just on our health issues. We focus on lack of money, problems at our work and job, broken relationship. We are not able to maintain that. These are the black dots we often talk about. Do we focus on the white page? Do we focus what God has given to us? When we are talking today on this topic, attitude of gratitude, what is gratitude? Gratitude means, as we heard from our guests, gratitude means gratefulness, thankfulness, to give thanks, to be grateful for whatever we have received from others and God. It is also meant for recognition or you can say appreciation for others. Whatever we have received from others, just think, do we appreciate others for their work? As we heard from one of the guests that in USA we have a very nice culture of saying thank you for every single thing. Yes, I am also impressed with this uh, attitude. So this is what we have to develop in our life. This is the attitude. We need to acknowledge. Do we acknowledge others? Do we acknowledge whatever we have received? Or our achievements, or the achievements of others, or our or others' attainments. This is the attitude of gratitude to recognize, to acknowledge, to appreciate. And when we live in this world, we are always interdependent on each other. Can we think of our existence being a single person? We are interdependent. The food which we are taking, who is creating food? 
somebody has to work hard in the field somebody has to sow the seed somebody has to bring the harvest to the market somebody is selling the clothes which we are putting on our body how many hands have contributed towards that if you think about from the base level every single thing has some contribution from the society from other people don't you think that we are so comfortable sitting here talking on this topic as compared to many more in this world and who has provided us god has provided us our own fellow beings are providing us to tell you gratitude when we talk about this gratitude in our vedic scriptures it is mentioned that each one of us who is who is born on this earth planet has incurred five loans we can say borrowings i'm not talking about loan from the banks which we take or mortgage i'm talking about the scriptural borrowings what are these five borrowings we need to repay it is said they are known as rina in sanskrit pitra rina borrowings from the parents we have borrowed a lot look this face we have borrowed this face from our parents don't we look alike we don't we look like our parents if you don't then there is something problem <laughs> <laughs> then one can question the nose which is here this is the nose i borrowed from my father or mother and that's why people say that eyes of this baby are looking like mother or father we often try to compare just think that when we are born when we were baby our mother took care of us feeding us first thing keeping her in her home for 9 months nourishing us the food which mother took we were nourished by that food the breath she took that's the breath we were surviving in the mother's womb and then she spent sleepless nights when we were sick our father gave us support so that we are here we got best education so moral support it is from father who taught us learning the first word in our mouth mom or ma it comes in the mouth who taught us who taught us how to walk isn't it our parents we are indebted to our parents love and respect your parents this is the borrowing from the parents so first thing we are grateful to the parents and in every step of our life we have to be thankful to them i am i am really surprised sometimes i feel sorry when i see here lot of people have problems with their own parents they don't go along they don't live with them not only living but they leave them in nursing homes or you know homeless shelters is this the way of paying gratitude to our parents let us change this we are indebted the second borrowing which scripture still it is borrowing from the society samajarin whatever we consume whether it is the cloth whether it is food chemicals or medicine everything has come from the society we are indebted to the society so we need to serve the society we should be grateful to each and every person contributing towards our growth our evolution third borrowing it is bhutarina ecology or nature we are indebted we get milk from cows we get honey from the bees we get silk cloth from the insects everything comes from nature nature is giving us drinking water food is coming from nature so we are thankful and we should preserve the nature not destroying it this is our gratefulness paying our gratitude to the nature then we are also indebted to our teachers all those scientists who spend their valuable time and energy and brought us to this stage where we are so comfortable they did beautiful research including our saints and sages there were also they were also scientists 
making their own body as laboratory, meditating deeply and finding truth and wisdom, then giving us that knowledge. So we are indebted to all our teachers, from school time, college time, university, spiritual teachers, who are has taught us, they are our teachers. We are indebted to them, we should be grateful to them. And then we are also indebted or we are having borrowing with, from God. We are indebted to God, which is called Devarina. Devarina, are we not indebted to God? Everything comes to us as a blessing from God. Quoting the Holy Bible, it is in the Genesis. Second chapter, seventh passage. Lord God formed man out of dust of ground, then he breathed into his nostrils breath of his life. Whose breath it is? It is not my breath, it is breath of God. Because he breathed into this nostrils. The same thing you will find in Tetri Upanishad, the mantra says, Tat Srashtva Tadev Anupravishat Having created everything, God entered into his very creation. So this is not my breath. Who has given me life? It is God. So I am grateful to God for this life. Then I am grateful to God for whatever he has provided for my existence and survival. When we live in this world, we need to develop this attitude of gratitude. For every single thing, as we heard from another guest that we should thank for everything. So this is the attitude we need to develop. And remember, when we are grateful to others, we can never feel sorrow. Because it's a different feeling. A feeling of joy, a feeling of contentment, feeling of fulfillment. When we are thankful to others, we are grateful to others, we can never feel depression. We were facing a question about mental illness, it will not come. If we are really thankful, if we are grateful to God, grateful to others, no matter what we have received, don't look at the dots, look at what we are provided for. Then no mental illness will be there. So this is the attitude of gratitude we have to develop. And when we talk about this breath, it is breath of God and constantly God is breathing within us, non-stop. Just think if God stops breathing, what will happen? So we should be grateful to God for every breath. And this is what we practice in Kriya Yoga. What is Kriya Yoga? Kriya Yoga as you know, Yoga means union, union of body and soul, union of microcosm with macrocosm, union of this individual consciousness with cosmic consciousness. And what is Kriya? Simply putting Kriya has two syllables, Kri and Ya. Kri means all the activities in daily life and Ya means divinity. So to feel presence of divinity in each and every activity of life is known as Kriya. Any activity which reminds us of presence of God is Kriya. Means when we are breathing, feeling presence of God, this is Kriya. So in each breath we can thank God and we must thank God. However, I am really happy today on this auspicious occasion of having our annual interfaith. So now it is my turn to express gratitude to all of you. <laughs> so I would like to take this opportunity. My sincere thanks to all the eminent guests who have accepted this invitation and spend their beautiful time with us. We are thankful to the moderator for this beautiful job. It's not always easy, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we are thankful to all the audience and uh, the organizers. And we are looking forward to have more, much more opportunities like this uh, Interfaith Seminar to sit together. And it has been very enlightening and divine uh, experience today to share our views, our ideas, our thoughts from 
different major religions, traditions, and to listen to their wisdom. Surely we must have been benefited today, at least I am benefited. So what is the take of this today from this seminar? That we need to be grateful and gratefulness is value. So let us count our blessings, not the troubles. World will be like that. This is the creation of duality, but let us focus on positive attitude of gratitude. Let us thank God. So once again, I'm thankful to all of you. And uh, now I would request So as a token of love, we would like to express our gratitude to all the eminent guests. But after that, uh, we would request our guests and all of you to join us for the dinner. So when you leave the hall, towards the right, you just follow the corridor and towards the right there is gymnasium where uh, vegetarian dinner is prepared for all of you, so please uh, join us. And if you cannot make it, then please take some snacks with you on your way. So, so please uh, uh, be seated and let the panelists go leave first and then you can all follow. So once again, thank you very much and uh, I would like to conclude this uh, seminar with a prayer for peace and prosperity for the whole humanity. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma kasche dukha bhag bhavet Om shanti 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 May all become happy and healthy. May everyone be loving, noble, kind and generous. May there be no sorrow, no suffering. May there be more love, peace, harmony, prosperity everywhere. Om. Amen. Thank you all. Amen.
you. Let's all give each other a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So once again, thank you very much for coming here. And uh, please come back again and again. This is the place open for all of you. This is your second home.